On behalf of all of us here, we want to welcome you to this World Press Conference with the aim of bringing to public the continued harassment and assault of innocent human rights defenders in the course of their duties to promote and protect the human rights of others in Nigeria. As a group of human rights organizations and citizens of Nigeria, working to protect and promote women's human rights across the country. We are here today to stand in solidarity with one of the foremost human rights defenders group and leading women's rights organization in Nigeria, the Women's Aid Collective, whose premises was invaded and activities obstructed by officers of the Nigerian Police Force on the 30th of the 27th of January Oh, 30th of January, 2020. The officer, also without recourse to law, or the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, also detained Miss Goodness. The action of the police force in Enugu State and the Women in Collective Office further brings to form the extent of abuse that human rights defenders often suffer from the hands of the Nigerian police force that is supposed to be working and protecting them. As you may be aware, the Women's Aid Collective was established in 1997 as an independent, non-governmental, non-political, and not-for-profit organization, and was registered in 2000 as a company limited by guarantee, a charitable organization with the corporate affairs of Nigeria. Wako's vision it's a democratic society free from, free from violence and abuse. We are human rights of all persons in particular. Women and young people are recognized in law and in practice. We are called as an observer status with the African Union, the African Commission, and the UN ECOSOC. We are called as being on ground supporting and promoting women's human rights and they take nothing less than 4,000 cases of rape, domestic violence, sexual assault, and other violations against women. It's because of the work of WACO and the work that the founder of WACO had done in this country that, that through a vote of the public in 2019, she was given an award of the uh, Human Rights Defender of the year 2019. Please a round of applause. So we are then surprised if, despite the work that WACOL is doing, that the police can invade such an office that is doing good for the Nigerian people. Then the question is, who then can the police not invade? I will give the microphone to the founder of WACOL to narrate uh, the experience of WACOL, knowing fully that this is not the first time that the Nigerian police force will be doing this. This is the second time, in particular, you know, to work on. And I am also aware of several organizations, including Dorothy Jamese Foundation, that have suffered this kind of violence at one point or the other. So this is a response to the threat to all of us. Because an injustice to one is an injustice to, to all. So all of us have been threatened. So I will call on the uh, founding director of WACO to go ahead to narrate the incident. I want to start by saying that WACO in the past two decades of his existence, and I always say this everywhere, there is no day a letter does not leave to, from WACO to the police in terms of referral and that we work and have worked consistently with the police. That this current, even this current IGB when it was a commissioner of police in the state, to tell you the kind of work we are do and the way the recognition, used to visit our office regularly to see what cases and was quite supportive of the work we do. And some other commissioners of police have been. Even the last case, you all of you that knew, that happened in the network, that was uh, the girl that was maltreated, the very young girl, you know, the housemaid phenomenon. Even Enugu State Police handed over the, 
the girl to Wakul, and we are taking care of him. So I just want to acknowledge that and the fact that we've had good relationship also in the past. But it, and even currently. But just to underscore the fact that even what they did to us, the seriousness of it, because if with this very good working relationship, and there was a survey that was done, not even by us, by one of our partners, Rola, can you hear? Yeah, didn't come on this part of the table when it was even uh, justice for all. And they found that Wako was a common name in, uh, in Enugu, over 95%. Just say Wako, they know what it means, men and women, and they know what it stands for. So it's not that the police is not aware, but for them to have come to brutalize the staff of Wako in the manner they did. In fact, when their backup they came, come, or called, came, even one of them said, ah, it's Wakolo. Why are we here on this type of mission? But the men and women who came, two men, two women, were all a mob team. On Monday 27th of January 2020, one Miss E.I., the victim, and who is also here with us, made a distress call. And it was actually to me, but I was not in Enugu. And I, I did referral immediately that you go to the office, and I called, it, not for her to go, I immediately called our team of lawyers, counselors, and even students on campus to support her, that vehicle was coming to be part of. Because I asked her, she was raped, she's on campus, but it raped to a, a place outside campus. So from there, our good legal team considered her report and thought it wise, of course, that rape was such a serious crime, it's part of the routine work we do. And to that effect, one of our long lawyers that I called that very evening when I got that call was goodness, Ivan. And goodness immediately said, yes, ma'am, ma I will be on my way shortly. I said, Doctor, now they will take you with the vehicle. You go and you get it. I've already called some other backup. And that's what we did. And the next day, they went to hospital. They went to police. And I was the one who recommended, because it was already getting late, go to area command to make the report. And by next day, usually we have our referrals accompanied by formal letter. And the formal letter we did, and I will show you in a short while. So the police, by doing so, requested police to, to, to do the needful because this is a very serious crime, a felony. We handed over the victim to them, and our lawyers were present when the victim statement was obtained. And at that point, it was reasonably expected that the police had formally taken over investigation from us. And police later called a lawyer seated here, goodness in Baghdad, requesting her to provide the victim to them as the parents of the suspect had plans of settling the issue with the victim and the family. Goodness told them that she had handed over the matter to them and therefore they should source the victim by themselves with the contact details she provided in her statement with them. But instead of inviting the victim with the contact details she provided in her statement, the area commander inspector, um, uh, Inspector Chinere, in charge of uh, JWC, and some other officers in the station kept calling goodness, trying to intimidate and coerce her to provide the victim for settlement, which we can just tell that they wanted to settle a criminal matter out of court without even any investigation, but they wanted a seal of approval from Wako. To our utmost dismay, on 30th January 2020, four police officers, two men and two women in Mopti from Area Command, stormed our office and still requested the office to provide the victim. The legal unit of our office repeated to them that we had already handed over the matter to them and they should look for the victim themselves using the contact details that she provided in the statement. Before then even, the police had Giving a police report, because usually the practice when you go, you get the form for medical report, and we did, and they asked us to pay for the report, and we did. And the report is here. And they put rape on the female, and they documented it. Everything is 
documented. So to 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 really so on that third yet, this officer still failed to list it that they should look for the victim, but rather started entering all the rooms in our office building. And when they saw goodness who was having a meeting in one of the offices, this officer mercilessly beat her up to a state of unconsciousness. They extended the beating because when we are talking about uh, one uh, beating, it wasn't only one. They extended the beating to Mrs. Ineka Oko. But her own was the main target. Ineka Oko, where are you? Ineka Oko is one of the staff, longest serving staff of Wako. She's been with us for over 20 years. And Ineka usually we call her even a lawyer. She's a paralegal. But even clients even take her advice more than they do for lawyers. Because she's been there, she's the one who receives all the cases and clank the cases and then do that. So she too got a blow. You see her eyes, you see her medical report. But it was, they were aiming the blow, of course, as they were beating her. She came to prevent them and they beat her also up in the process. It was such a deserted beating that at a point, goodness ran into the office toilet to save her dear life. Yet, the four officers chased her like a hardened criminal into the toilet, dragged her out and continued beating this helpless and unarmed lady who was, whose offense was assisting the police to cop crime in the state. After beating her to their satisfaction, they whisked her to their office along the head of our legal unit, Gechezai, who actually had already volunteered that they should take her instead of goodness, that she is the one that signed the letter that forwarded the case to the police. And therefore, that she should take responsibility. But they said, no, it's goodness that they wanted. While this was going on, the crowd who came to Wako with their different matters ran away. It was like a war zone. And this happened shortly before 2 p.m. At area command, the two lawyers were detained and their two phones collected from them and seized. The officers insisted that they must produce the victim. And I don't need to tell you that by the time they got to the station, the parents of the alleged rapist were already there, waiting. And they started even abusing our staff on top of that, especially good of, uh, goodness. All manner of emotional and, and, and abuse. To the extent that the officers had to, even made her to pull off her, uh, her, her clothes. She told them that she was having breathing difficulty at that point and needed urgent medical attention as a matter of fact. But they turned deft here and continued to force her to make statement and to produce the victim for settlement. Around 3 p.m., she fainted and collapsed while still in custody. And instead of rushing her to hospital, they left her for another 20 minutes there. It was a uh, pro bono lawyer, Daniel uh, Onyana, Onyana Go Esquire. Dan, uh, Dan, you're here. You will be able to take questions at some point. Dan, Daniel, Mr. Daniel, Onyanago. One of our people who saw the police, because once this was happening, we activated all of our lawyers, pro bono, and those in house, and everybody, they, they ran. It was, he was the one who took goodness in his own vehicle to a National Orthopedic Hospital Emergency Unit, which luckily was not far from that police station. Two police officers accompanied him also when they were going, but on getting to the hospital, when they noticed that she was like lifeless, and they thought that she had already died, the police officers disappeared quickly. So it was at the hospital, a team of doctors, the oxygen, and everything did their best. And by that time, they got in touch with me. I was in, a, in a Lagos, so distressed, monitoring. I had to call the CP immediately because they were calling me, and I was a book reviewer to a book uh, by Honorable Justice Izoba, and I was at the Civic Center. They made several calls to me, but I couldn't answer. My phone was on silent. Once I saw the call and I picked up and they told me what was happening, I called the CP, who said he was in Abuja, and quickly uh, the CP called me back and then called the area command to know what was happening. And it was uh, at that stage that uh, they knew that Others were interested in the matter because before then they had actually gone, but that was already late. Around she has been finally, she wasn't resuscitated when I got the CP, but finally she was uh, resuscitated. And then uh, before then, the police went back 
even another state CID, another squad of police, and then the hospital refused them admission into the hospital and at a state we felt it wasn't safe. The hospital also agreed it wasn't safe for her to continue to remain there and she was immediately evacuated with the assistant of the hospital uh, to another uh, hospital. WACO for years has been effective in, in interventions of rights of abused women and children and has set on parallel records of assisting the police in common crimes in the country. So it is a more great to an office such as ours and it is totally unacceptable and must be fully investigated to bring the culprit to account. The work of WACO let the Nigerian public, of course, as, as this person has said, to say, look, because when I say I am the winner of 1990, I say no. It is about the people that we work for and it's about the team that work with me. It is really unfortunate, as has been noted, that this is a pattern. In 2017, precisely December 12th, and unfortunately, this is Neka Opo, will be the second time she's getting this physical beating. Yet, she's the first to sleep in police station with clients. She doesn't mind whatever time it takes. She goes to every, they all know her. She was beaten in 2017, and even the head of her legal unit then was undressed, her dress torn completely by the police from Zone 9, Omaha, and also connivance or they, they mobilized local police, and that was also from area command. The same thing, any case they are interested in, for which there has been inducement, they will just act without even looking back. It is most unfortunate, and we don't want this to continue. And all we are asking is justice for goodness. Who is the lawyer of Wako? Justice for Neka. Okay. Who is also, who is also from Wako? And justice for, uh, to, for, for the survivor. Because she is here and she will speak for herself and we will give you time. You know, we will ask you please to listen to them and we want to maintain her identity. If anybody needs to be exposed, it is the perpetrator, yes. Mr. Uche Na Emenike. Let her then be on the pages of newspaper, not the name of the victim or the survivor. She will speak to us. Goodness is here and goodness will tell her story. Nekoko is here and she will tell her story. And then they can do it very briefly so that you will hear. It is not hearsay from me or those of us who are privileged to tell. But it is about the people who suffered harm and violation of their right first hand. So what we are saying is that we know now the Enugu State, the Enugu State Police have set up a panel. They've been telling the get some of our, uh, our, our, our staff. They, they said they will investigate the matter quickly. But we think also that this is not something that a police can be a judge in their own case. That we need an independent panel we need intervention of police service commission. Yes. We need to be assured guarantee of non-reputation. Yes. Guarantee of satisfaction and apology. Yes. And then to say never again. Never again. Never again. Never again. Never again. Never again. We have to end the police impunity. Yes. We have to demand accountability. Yes. That brutality was unwarranted. Yes. And the brutality must stop. Yes. It could be about it is goodness today. It can be me. It can be me. It can be you. you tomorrow. So we have to we take it. Them, we know to them anything.
I cannot even tell their story because these two young women seated here especially, or the three of them, but particularly the two that witnessed police brutality and insensitivity, even from the report of the rape case to questions and insinuations at police station to what they had to make the victim go through, statement over statement over statement over, just to wear her down so that she can be forced to settle, to even telling her, of course, if you are giving money, won't you take and go? You know? So you will hear from them to know where we are with this kind of case. If police that is meant to protect us is the one that is uh, abusing our right. From everything that happened on 27th, it all started from 27th when we got to the station and the inspectors there asked the victim if it was raped with consent or raped without consent. Ah. So at that point, I had to, together with Dr. Namichi that was in Spain, we had to caution them to stop using words like that. And I specifically asked the inspectors that I know they go through law courses while training.
So have they ever heard of rape with consent or rape without consent? So one of them made a, made a side comment saying that the girl is even, so is, she's even old enough to start having sex, so why are we making an issue? So we insisted and they effected the arrest that day. So the next day we came back to the station for other um, paperwork and all. So while she was giving her statement, she was writing her statement, they started again and they started asking her um, if she knows the boy questions. They said one made a comment that uh, the boy alleged that she has been sleeping with him, so why is she making a video? And the victim told them that she does not have any kind of relationship of that sort with the boy. But they still insisted, and one also for that stated that she, she's not even a baby, she's 21, so sex should be a normal thing for her. So at that point, I, I had to speak up, and I told them that this girl is already traumatized, and saying stuff like this is not going to help. So I asked them to either stop the discussion, or leave the room, or give us another room, so she can write her statement without interruption. So Inspector Chinyere, together with another um, officer, called me out of the room and told me that I should, um, that why would I talk to the area commander in that way? And I said, first of all, I didn't know that he was the area commander. Second of all, he couldn't have changed anything. Because what he was doing, he should know better what, that what he was doing was wrong. And I went back into the room where she was writing the statement. So while she was about finishing her statement, Inspector Chinyere walked over to her and told her, that she should not fill the last three lines. And I asked why. And she said uh, that she wants uh, that the girl, that they want to settle the girl. This was barely 24 hours after the rape incident. That they want to settle the girl. They want to give her money to cover for her medical bills. So I, I turned immediately to the victim and asked her, what do you want? And she categorically stated that she wanted the matter to be prosecuted accordingly that she wanted the boy and his family to desist from threatening her and her family, and also she wanted her professional life to, to be covered because the boy's father is a surveyor, and she, she was also in the field. So I told her, write it down, what she wants from this case, and she wrote it and she signed. So that same night, I got a call from Inspector Chinyere asking me to come to the station with the girl, and she told me that I understand that again, it's a small girl, and she will not want to go through the trauma of um, court cases and all that. That I should talk to the girl, that since I'm the girl's lawyer, she will listen to me. I should talk to the girl to consider settling the matter, that they will give us the money. So immediately, I contacted my superior in the office and related to them what the police were saying and all. It didn't stop there. The area commander called me. They started insisting that I provide the girl. And I told them, the girl already put her statement and her name is there, her contact and everything. Her, even her house address is there. So why not go to her and all? But then he was like, I should bring the girl, I should bring the girl, I should bring the girl together with the clothing she was wearing and all. So I'm getting to the office. I'm getting to the office that they, they still, they kept calling me. And even the, the girls, the boys, the perpetrator's parents were still trying to get to us to talk to the girl and everything. So when I get into the office, um, I, I spoke to the HOD and they said, to the best of our knowledge, the last time we spoke to the girl, she said she wasn't feeling so well because she was still taking her drugs, but that she would come to the station immediately if she can, which was that 30th, before the close of work for 30th of January. So I was upstairs doing my report for in the meeting when I said to come downstairs to get our office model. And coming down, the, the, road, the road downstairs was also lighted, and I saw somebody grab me and started shouting. So I'm trying to know, identify the person. I wanted to, like, trying to open the communication door, and she shouted, and somebody else came in, and they started grabbing me and dragging me. So immediately I started screaming, because I didn't know who they were, or what, why they were grabbing me. And that part of our office was actually an area that was not open to the public. So I was surprised somebody was even there. And they said pulling me and hitting me and all manner of things. So I get into the station. After they succeeded in getting me out, after the beating and everything, we got to the station. I told them I was thirsty and they refused to give me water. 
that one of the inspectors told me that this won't be the first time a lawyer is going to die in custody. So I won't be the first person. I believe you. It happened to me too. I believe you. He called the boy's parents to the room and the boy's parents that they called me prostitute, slut, and all manner of names that I connived with the victim to destroy the boy's father's reputation. And at that point, I was still feeling very down, so I immediately gave. They refused me to make a call. They said they brought the phone and went. Like I wrote a statement, and um, one of them ordered that they brought the handcuff. So they, they, they forced me to call the victim with my phone to come down to the station. And I was already feeling really dizzy and all. So I kept shouting that I think I need medical help. Or nobody listened at all. So the next 30 minutes or so, I was, I don't know, I can't really recall. Or I woke up in the hospital with doctors and nurses around. Ever since, I've not, I've not had peace of mind. I've been followed everywhere. Everywhere I go to, I've been followed. I don't even, I'm not even assured of my safety any longer. The area command in Ogo State, um, because I was called that some of the um, workers, particularly this lady here, Barista Goodness, was taken to the police. She was arrested. That was the information I got, together with one other staff of the office by name Barista Eza. So I proceeded immediately to the area command. When I got there, both of them were incarcerated. They were in custody. So I tried to find out from them why, why they were keeping them. I called the area commander himself. And he told me that they were not under arrest. I said, what are you saying? That they are not allowed to move about freely. And I'm here and I'm seeing them. It was at that point that they ordered the head of legal unit, Ezani, that is Ezani, to start making her statement. I was outside when I started hearing noise inside, where we are goodness and that is Ezani, we are being kept in custody. I got there and saw that she was already, she collapsed and was gasping for breath. I, I, I expected the police to do something about it because she was actually dying. For upwards of 10 minutes, they didn't do anything. 20 minutes, they didn't do anything. My vehicle was parked outside. I had to proceed outside to get my own vehicle to the police premises. Moved her, the company of two police officers, to orthopedic hospital, being the nearest police hospital in that area. So when we got to that place, it was even the two police officers, she, that by the time we got to the hospital, she was already gone. Totally lifeless. So the two police officers helped to carry her to the corridor of the hospital. So they thought she was dead already. That was the last time we saw them. They disappeared immediately, she was dropped on the ground. And the doctors came to work, and at a point she was revived. On the 27th of January, I I was asked by um, which is the MNK, who was an old friend for Hangout. And now I agreed based on the fact that one of our mutual friends would follow us for the Hangout. On a normal, I thought it was normal Hangout in school where you can sit out and you know talk and have a drink. So when they came to my hostel, they, I asked them, I asked Uche Nemenke, where are we going to save his house? I told him then that I'm not going anywhere with you. Then our mutual friend said that he would accompany us, that he would, he would be there with us at the hangout. I said, fine, since it's the three of us, that I'm good to go. Then we bought food and we are headed to the guy's house. Then two blocks away from the, two houses away from the guy's house, then our mutual friend gave the guy his bag. And I don't know whether he received the call, but he said that he had to go and give his roommate's key to their lodge. Then I, I told him that I was not going to go. If he's not going with me, he said I should go. That, that I should give him just 10 minutes or 20 minutes that he will be back and that he promised. Then I told him, fine, that since you're coming back, please be fast. I can't stay in the same house alone with this guy. He now said, fine. Then we entered the guy's house. 
and he locked the door because it's a big two place. So he locked everywhere, the whole windows and the doors were locked. Then we sat down at the dining room. Then he came over and started touching me. I told him no, that I didn't come here to mess around with you. And you should know the kind of person I am. I'm a very disciplined person. So don't try that rubbish again. So the guy said sorry. Then I asked him to get me water. Then he sat, he came back and sat down again. He started touching. I told him, please don't. That I don't I'm going through a lot of trauma now. Don't add to it. I don't need any disturbance. Then he now said I should dance with him. I said, I'm tired. He dragged me. I told him I'm tired. Then I made a distress call to my friend in Lagos, telling him that that I was at the friend's house and look at what is going on. The guy said I should tell him to show me a restroom so I could lock myself inside. At least I made calls to some of our friends so that they could come to my rescue. So when I asked the guy about our mutual friend, he said he was coming, that he's almost here. And I said, fine, we sat at the, I told him that please, we were at the parlor. He said, I told him, please, come and show me restroom. Uh, um, I, I want to ease myself. So he carried me to one room, I, I guess it's the uh, visitor's room. So I told him this is not a restroom. That I didn't, I, I'm not seeing any toilet unless my glasses are, I, now I'm blind. So he said that the toilet was inside. I said, you should show me. He showed me the toilet. So I, I was about closing the door. Then the door was not closing. He used his leg as a wedge between the door and the, and the frame. So I told him that you should please go That I want to make use of the bathroom. Then he dragged me out. I was shouting. He pushed me on the bed and held my neck with his foot. Let's talk All right, thank you. Oh, no, it's okay. Just it's okay. So, what happened there? Please, leave, 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 leave that part because it's so it's re traumatizing you. Can you please go to the police one and issue of settlement? Just so, we just go to the police that night. Police, we are making side comments and saying that why should I go to the guy's house? That I was the one that went to come for trouble when we went on our way to arrest the boy. Then the, bo the police were yeah, harassing me and calling me on my number of things. Then the next day, I go to the police station with Barrister Goodness to to get medical reports to go to the hospital. <laughs> then when we came back from the medical reports procedure, I was writing my statement. Then Inspector Chinger asked me to leave three spaces. So I left three spaces there. And they asked she asked me what do I want police to do for me. I said I wanted the police to punish them. To punish him. Then he she now laughed and said that I should come let her tell me something that if the boys people should give me money and pay for my medical bills that would I like that one I told her no that I don't want it then she said I should write what I want the police to do then I wrote it that the police to should persecute and charge the boy then she now said the boy's mother wanted to greet me I said greet me is it to take me for how her son finished raping me and he's denying everything in front of people. Then I now went back to school. I could not go anywhere. I was so traumatized. Nobody could understand how I was. Um, thank you. I think we'll stop there. Yes. Yes. When they moved the case, the, the barrister, the guy's barrister, called I and my dad aside and said that we should close down this case that's in Poland that girls that are raped can never be married by anybody. That if I wanted to get married, that I should close down the case, destroy the evidence, tell the police to call the investigation off, and tell the worker that I want to settle. And my dad agreed, actually. And I told him, no, that he should not discuss it with my mom, that I'm not interested in settling with anybody. Okay, that's okay. I think it's okay. Uh, I should think of marrying the okay. boy. No, don't, no, it's, it's okay, it's okay. Marry your
it's, yes. it's okay, it's okay. I, I think it's okay. Uh, it's, it's quite uh, relieving all of this, it's quite traumatizing. And uh, we just hope that she can recover with all the support uh, that uh, many organizations are willing to provide in terms of counseling and, and, and medical uh, support. Um, as it, it will be good that we hear from NECA. Where is the NECA? Please, can you say quickly in two minutes what happened and how you two became a victim of physical assault by the police? When uh, Bata uh, Goodness was coming out from us, the speaker model, Mrs. Soha, the head of uh, WJC, rushed her. Started beating her, so you are here. She started calling others, come, she's here, she's here, she's here. They started dragging her forcefully. She was telling them, leave me, what did I do, what did I do? She ran right to her office, the toilet, she followed her, continued beating, continued dragging her. Then I was trying to prevent them, telling police, please, please, police. One of the, 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 the blows landed on my eye, why? I started crying, shouting, police, you have killed me on my eye, my eye. They kept on dragging her. They didn't even listen to me. So one of them, one of the men police officers said, leave her, I'm coming, I'm coming. In Uwai, with their, his head, broke our office. In the, when they were trying to break the office, they just hit my, 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 head, my head on the, on the, uh, on the door. So, but the uh, goodness, keep on crying. I'm a lawyer, and you people are treating me like this. I'm not a criminal. What did I do to deserve this kind of a thing? So later, they took her to the police. But before then, the parents of the perpetrator came to the office for settlement. So it was not too long they left before the police invaded our office. Looking at the young girl here, yeah, it could be my daughter, and uh, this is happening to her. The young lawyer also being uh, assaulted by the police. Police that should actually take care of us, protect us, and the people attacking us. This is something that we cannot condone. So I'm using this opportunity to plead with the press. You have always been a reliable uh, supporter. You have been our ally. Please, put this thing out to the public. Follow it up. Let there be justice for these victims. We are only asking for justice. We are saying that the uh, alleged rapist should be prosecuted. We are saying that the police should stop brutalizing women. We have suffered so much. There's violence everywhere against us. Women that are in politics, they are facing violence. Women that are working in offices, there's still workplace violence. Students, everywhere you go to, there's violence you know, waiting for us, as if God created us for, uh, to be abused by men. So we are saying, please, the general public, the press, and uh, everyone that is interested, any woman that is a mother or an intending mother should rise up against this injustice. So we are here to say no to violence. We are here to say justice for goodness. We are saying justice for the rape victim. And we are saying justice also for Mrs. Uh, uh, Opo. It's really disheartening that in 2020, we should, as human rights defenders, be struggling for a relationship, a, a sane relationship with the law enforcement agencies in Nigeria. Our understanding is that we have a police that, I mean, a police force that is developing into a world-class force. We have more educated and more um, trained persons who understand human rights. But to see what has happened in Enugu, it's really disheartening and we think it's a drawback to the progress we have made in Nigeria. The bodies of women, the dignity of women, and the safety of women is sacrosanct. If our women are not safe, if we don't feel safe to defend those who are weak, those of us who have given up our lives to defend those who are weaker than us, if we do not feel safe to it with the insecurity that we have around us, then the, 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 the situation is really dire. On this basis, and on behalf of all women's rights defenders, I call on the government, the institutions of law enforcement, as well as concerned citizens, to raise their voices against brutality, against 
women's and human rights defenders in Nigeria. Thank you very much and we look forward to your cooperation, especially the media. Thank you.